everyone. I'm here in Ravenal del Camino, the heart of the Camino Frances. However, I can't show you any pilgrims today because I basically shuttered the house up because my puppy, the newest pilgrim, just arrived uh, this past week and he's having a little trouble getting used to pilgrim sounds, you know, the click, clack, step, step, click, clack. So uh, we're trying to get him acclimated. Uh, so he might chime in today. I'm sorry if he does. I'll try to quiet him down. But um, We'll roll with it, right? That's what we do at the Camino Cafe. So uh, a couple of things. If you haven't already, please join the Camino Cafe podcast group. So this group is a private group and it's people that are fans, supporters of the show. And I'm going to start doing some lives there with authors and uh, I'll be doing a weekly live. I'll be sharing life on Robin Alto Camino and in Spain. And it's a place where you can connect with other pilgrims, maybe meet somebody that you might walk with. You could share your own story. Uh, and I think the lives are going to be really great with the authors. So after I interview folks, they may come back for a live and then you'll get to ask follow up questions, which will be really fun. So anyway, join that. It's on Facebook, the Camino Cafe podcast group. So I have a page, right? But I'm talking about the group. That's where you're going to get the special stuff. So um, what else did I want to mention? Also, I had recent interviews. We had the interview with Rocco and with Carlota and with Anne. They are I tell you folks, I fall in love with every single person I interview with uh, because I just love pilgrims, but uh, those three really had some great things to say, and I know we're going to have the same thing today. So uh, I have Jean Borshus. Did I get that right? Brocious. Brocious. I'm sorry. I told him I'm really terrible at names, <laughs> so there we go. Anyway, Jean and I have been trying to do this interview <laughs> forever today, and uh, all because of me, I, we've had to reschedule I don't know how many times. So Jean, thank you for being so patient with me as I am trying to adjust living in Spain as an expat, and he is also an expat, so uh, we're becoming friends, and he's telling me, uh, giving me tips about how to live here, so that's always nice. So welcome to the Camino Cafe. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lee, so much for uh, inviting me to do the bot podcast, and I'm uh, very much of a pleasure to uh, be here with you today. Excellent. Well, I think we first met, uh, I think, over Instagram, and which is really fun to meet people in that way, and you had mentioned that you had written a new book, A Daily Devotional, I want to get the title correct, uh, A Daily Pilgrim Devotional, and um, I was very intrigued by it because I found out about this right before I was heading to Spain and doing my second Camino. And so I bought the book right away. And uh, it's a lovely book, beautiful cover. I don't, do you have it there sitting near you? <laughs> Yay, there it is. There it is. So uh, I bought it right away and you can see it's a nice size. He's purposely sized it. So we'll talk about that. Um, but I want to start with just a reading from it, and um, then we'll get into talking about that, and we're going to talk about Jean's pilgrimage and I don't know, all kinds of things. You know how we are at the Camino Cafe. So um, there's a reading right at the very beginning of the book, uh, Jean, and I loved it. It's titled Before the Journey. It's a Rumi quote, and I love Rumi, but I love what it says. Be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder. Help someone's soul heal. Walk out of your house like a shepherd. You have been a source of pain. Now you will be the delight. You have been an unsafe house. Now you'll be the one who sees into the invisible. So, Jean doesn't know this, but when I read that, uh, it kind of gave me some inspiration for my walk because when I walked the first time, I carried some little quotes with me and handed those out to folks. But this time um, I was trying to pack lighter. <laughs> and when I read this, it really made me think about my first Camino where I was in a lot of grief and walking with a lot of pain. And I just really wanted to share that story with anyone that would listen. And this time this gave me the inspiration that maybe my gift this time could be to just listen to people, to be the listener this time. And so that became the gift of my Camino was trying to be the person that could hold space for people. So thank you for giving me that inspiration. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, what made you pick that quote to be the intro to your book, basically? Um, Rumi also um, was one of those ancient medieval um, philosophers and authors that spoke to me even during my own Camino. Um, 
I do not remember the name of the town um, that I was first introduced to Rumi, um, but um, I remember the meaning of that quote that was written or painted on a wall within a, uh, a small cafe. And it was about meeting people um, in their common interests and meeting people out in the field, so to speak, is that if you want to meet me, um, that we can share a commonality, meet me out where there's peace, meet me out where there is beauty. And this one specific quote, when I read it um, in this cafe, really stuck with me because I, um, at the time of my first part of the Camino, because I walked the Camino Frances and I had to do it in two legs or two, uh, two different journeys. And we'll get into that, why that was. Um, I didn't really have a sole purpose in starting out the Camino de Santiago. My purpose originally was just to give gratitude to thanks mm -hmm. to be alive. Um, I, um, while walking, as we all know, things then kind of surface up to the top that maybe we not had subconsciously we had been dealing with in our lives, but um, we were not in the right environment. We were not in the right place to for them to surface to the top. So um, not long after I saw that quote, the next day I remember walking to, um, it's in the first couple of days and I apologize for not remembering the town, but it was, uh, it was, the portion that all you could see was red poppies because I also had walked during one of the legs during spring and it was uh, before the Meseta and um, I think it was the bend right before Saint now that I'm uh, thinking about it, San Anton, um, mm -hmm. the Cathedral de San Anton, the ruins of San Anton and when I saw these red poppies and these flowers just everywhere, I had never seen such beautiful colors. And I, and I, and I um, one of the things that I had packed in my bag was my Nikon 7100. I had packed a big mm -hmm. camera. Um, and um, because I love to take photographs and I did not want to be glued to the phone all the time. So I, when I saw that, I, it immediately brought me back to the quote I saw in Rumi. And to me, it was heaven. That period of those fields with the flowers of all different types of variations of poppies, of oranges and reds and purples and violets. Mm -hmm. It just, I felt like that's, if I was to be buried, if I was to die and to be buried, that would be a perfect place because you'd be surrounded in beauty, you know? So um, as I was compiling the maxims and the um, quotes, for my book, I knew Rumi had to be one of them. And mm -hmm. so that, um, this specific quote where it says that um, we all have suffered some type of pain in our lives, but perhaps the Camino isn't so much about uh, dealing with that pain because perhaps somebody on that Camino needs you to help them to deal with their own pain. So that's um, uh, how I had planned to put this at the very, very beginning of a daily pilgrim promotional to get people in the correct mindset is that um, perhaps being a lifeboat for somebody else. I think that's a beautiful reminder to give to everyone because we can start our Camino and be so in our own heads and our own pain not realizing that the folks that we're going to be walking right next to are also in pain. Um, I just wanted to say, I can't even imagine seeing those poppies. What time of year did you walk? It must have been like springtime. It was in June. The June. first, second leg was in June. Um, okay. um, and the first time was in fall, in September. Because okay. just rounding that I know the curve you're talking about, and I can oh, imagine okay. flowers in those fields. And I was already so emotional getting to that spot and the mm -hmm. splendor of San Anton, like it just 
overwhelmed me with emotion. So I can't, if I had seen poppies, I would have been dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you thinking that's heaven. That's beautiful. Well, let's go back and talk a little bit about your Camino. So uh, what made you take that on? Because, you know, it's no walk in the park. <laughs> I mean, we can all do it, but it's a big adventure to take on. So what, what in the first place grabbed your attention and made you want to walk? Um, I moved to Spain from, uh, I was originally living in New York City, um, which I had lived in eight years. Um, and at that time, when I decided to up and leave the U.S., which was back in 2015, um, my life was not where I wanted it to be. I needed to make a change, but I wasn't really sure exactly how to make that change. I mean, it took me about almost a year to decide how I was going to transition out of the US, how I was going to transition out of New York at the time. Um, I uh, sent off an application for master's programs for postgrads, and um, I got accepted into uh, the one in Spain, uh, one in France, and one in Germany. I had, uh, had been traveling a lot prior to 2015. Um, overseas a lot to Europe, um, but I had never really considered a post-grad degree or a graduate degree, um, but uh, I needed a change, and so I finally accepted the post-grad degree in Spain, um, and that's how I got here originally. Um, that degree, the master's degree, was probably one of the most difficult intellectually uh, challenges that I've ever undertaken. Um, in the aspect that it was, um, it consumed my whole life. And it, and I wouldn't even say that in a positive, it was not necessarily all positive. Um, and so I needed, um, it was a two year program in industrial economics and it took me three years. So um, I, uh, I needed a break. I needed some kind of uh, break from the, uh, the difficulty of that specific program. And I heard of the Camino, I had heard of the Camino through a um, function that I actually went to through uh, an association called the Americans, Americans in Madrid or something like this. It was not, it was not with the U.S. Embassy, but it was, an, it was kind of um, a lot of people from the U.S. Embassy would go to some of these functions that uh, American Association of Madrid. Um, and so I was there for Thanksgiving, my first year, 2015, the fall of 2015. And I met a girl who um, I believe she was living here. I don't know. I don't really remember her details at the moment, but she had told me she had just walked the Camino. And I was like, I had never heard of the Camino up in 2015. Never, never. Wow. Not wow. a peripheral. I never researched it. It just was never in my peripheral uh, experiences or people that I knew. So she told me about it and walked in 33 days. And I was very like intrigued, you know, mm -hmm. like we all are when we first hear something that we're intrigued by that first, but you know, when I look back, it's, we're intrigued by it because we're supposed to be intrigued by it. It's fate, it's destiny in a way. And so I, I didn't, I thought about it, but I was so busy with school and was so stressed and whether or not I was going to complete it, whether I was going to graduate, this, everything. And I never started until it would have been 2016. Yeah, 2000, the fall of 2016 on September 1st is when I first started. And I decided within two weeks, um, in two weeks, I, I did the plans. I you know, got the Briarly book. I got one book for preparation. Um, didn't know the American Pilgrims and Camino. I was no longer in contact with the woman who had um, had walked. Um, but something was pulling at me, like everybody. It's um, I related. It's pulling to people's soul. It's pulling to. It's pulling to. It's the spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. It's 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 many things and i decided that this is what i needed to do for some reason or another and so i start out 
um, for me, it was just, I only had heard of Helena Frances, you know? So yeah. that's where I started. But I wanted to start in St. John Pied de Port because that's where the book said you had to start. So I, <laughs> you know, so that's what I, that's what I did. So some of the first, I um, hopped on a train um, and uh, made it to St. Jean Pied de Port. But it was, I was so naive at that time too, because I don't know, for some reason, even though I had the rarely book with me and I could see the stages, for some reason, I had this assumption that it was going to be easy that I'd be able to walk the whole route in maybe two weeks, you know, you know, how long does it really take you to walk? Yeah, I can do this because I, I also had a deadline that I was supposed to start the next, the next year at my university on September 21st. I started on September 1st. So I was like, oh yes, I'll just go and I'll just <laughs> finish walking everything by the 21st. This is, this was kind of my naivety at the time. Mm. Well, I can understand. Like I walked with other people that thought the same thing. You know, I, I would say, oh, you're going all the way to Santiago? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to be there. And they'd say something like two weeks from then. And I'd just look at them. <laughs> I'm like, oh, how are you going to do that? <laughs> so totally get that. I kind of touched for a moment about the fact that, so in 2015, you hear about this. Now you're a Camino pilgrim, a Camino author. And you use Briarley's book as your guidebook. And I think later he... He, I've seen quotes from him about your book. Um, yes, he, he endorsed my book. Yeah. yeah, so how do you, what does that feel like that you go from hearing about this at this random meeting from this other pilgrim, I, I'm assuming she was a pilgrim, and you're using his guidebook and then he writes in your book. Like, what's that feel like? I mean, now I feel very grateful. I feel very blessed. You know, I never expected to write a daily pilgrim devotional. It was never on my radar when I first started out. I think the experience of it, and even after that first leg of writing, I still had not any idea that I was going to write a book. Um, actually, write a book on a daily pilgrim devotion. I think over the past three, four years, I was researching to write another book. That was yeah. going to be my first book, but it was going to be historical nonfiction, but never this book and never the first book. Um, really? So how, so what happened? Why, why this book first? Was the other book going to be about the Camino as well? No, no, it was a completely different story. And it's still um, something that I will write about, but it's, it takes a different, it will be a different format, you know, because it's okay. a devotion. I was called to do it. Um, Lee, I can't explain it any other except God wanted me to write this book. Um, I, it came to fruition during COVID, during 2020, you know, the beginning of 2020, when I was living mm -hmm. in Madrid in my small attic apartment and the whole world, as we know, thought was crashing down around us, and especially Spain at that time, you know, it was Italy and then it was Spain and I was living in my attic apartment and I was beginning to get claustrophobic and I, the only thing I could hear was, you know, sirens daily. I can't even imagine. Thinking that my life was going to end. So, I mean, uh, because we didn't know, nobody knew. Such All I knew was what was going on in Spain that, you know, I can still, I can still see vivid pictures of, you know, people. When laying on their hospital floors about to die in Spain. It was horrible. And so- Were you in Madrid um, at that time? Yeah, I was living in Madrid. Which uh, Madrid was, it seemed like such an epicenter of things happening. It was. I, I can't even imagine. I'm so sorry. That had to be, I mean, this has been a terrible time for the whole world, but I think being right there at that time in a, in a, in a country, it's not your home country or away right. from people that had to be really challenging. In fact, you know, during that time, you know, I've always wrote letters. Like I'm a very keen on writing letters to people in the post. And anybody who knows me, her, my close friends, they, they will have received one of my letters. Mm. I mean, sometimes it's two, sometimes I send out four or five letters a month. Um, and during that time, I remember writing letters to 
I remember writing letters to my family saying, you know, maybe this was going to be it. it or friends or whoever. So in my apartment, I, I have always been an avid reader, you know, and doing research and co constantly reading, you know, you know, other people may read more than I do, but on average, I was reading 40, 40 books a year. Wow. And um, there was always um, quotes or maxims that I would come across in reading specifically of ancient authors. Uh, I love to read ancient philosophers from Greece and from Rome and, and during this specific time. And Greece is one of my, uh, I guess, my third home I, besides uh, the U.S., Spain, and Greece because I've traveled so much and I've lived temp part time temporarily in Greece. And I saw, and this is kind of where my first um, non historical nonfiction book was going to take place. Mm. And so as I started to collect, as I started to read, I would collect these small little quotes and all of the quotes and maxims that always would pull to me is people is quotes that involved walking involved taking the right path in life what is it is that um you have to do to be on the right path um people's journey would always speak out to me so um as i began reading and i began all of a sudden being connected to these small little quotes. And up at that time, I also was, um, I've al always have loved devotionals. I grew mm -hmm. up on devotionals, you know, my parents, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, and sometimes I would be gifted them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I was also at that time reading um, a book, a devotional um, by Ryan Holiday. I don't know if you know him. Um, on how to be a stoic and oh, it, oh the stoic one yes I follow yes, him on yes. Instagram oh his stuff is fantastic I want to get his new uh, journal do you have that no I don't have a new journal I don't have a new journal um, but I I had read that devotional over like twice the whole time and his, it was an annual devotion yeah. and you know I was like this is such a great idea for somebody to do this and I was like I most of all the Stoics I had sometimes really I've adhered to Stoic philosophy and how it kind of um, interacts with Christianity and how Christianity um, took some Stoic principles um, during the um, beginning of Christianity, as you know. So um, I was like, as I began gathering the quotes and I was reading his book along and um, I would like, wouldn't it be wonderful if I compiled enough of quotes that I could use in somewhat for a pilgrim setting? And so the idea started, but it hadn't come to fruition. But as I started to collecting more and more quotes and things that really spoke to me and things I wanted to try to get across to people and things that maybe help people as they're walking, that's how the design and that's how the book came together during the first part of 2020 while I was sitting in my Madrid during COVID. Well, Jane, this makes your book even more meaningful to me. I'm just hearing the story. I'm, I'm kind of seeing it in two ways if, and, and tell me if you kind of feel this way, but I, I feel like this book was a way for you to get through the stress of COVID. It, was, it gave you meaning during that time. And also, um, I love that you're a letter writer. I think that's super cool. And it's almost like it's your letter to pilgrims. It's like this letter of giving us all hope as we're walking, I think. I don't know. It's how I'm kind of feeling right now. Does it, does it feel that way to you, that it's kind of this gift to pilgrims, a, a, a way for you to reach out to folks? Thank you. Yes. I am not considered it, but um, I appreciate your... Um, heartfelt uh, meaning with that. Yeah. Let's read another quote. Um, I want to go to day 13, uh, page 25, if, if folks, if you have the book at home. Arriving is what you are destined for, but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years 
so you're old by the time you reach it, wealthy with all you've gained along the way, wise as you have become, you'll have understood by then its meaning. When I read that day 13, okay, first off, I'm not sure how to pronounce the author. Is it C.P. Kavavi? <laughs> how do you pronounce his last Kavavi. name? Kavavi. Kavavi, okay. Um, when I read that, uh, I was on my day 13. <laughs> um, it was such a great thing to hear at that point because I was in a real hurry to get to my new house in Spain. And um, I was walking and, and really wanting to, I was feeling like this rush, you know, rather than slowing down and just enjoying the time, I was kind of, I got to get there. I got to get there. And I was starting to get a little jealous of people that had no end date, right? They didn't have a, a flight home and they didn't know when they were going to arrive at their destination. But I had a date that I was trying to meet. Um, and so this, I actually read this one several days, not just on day 13, because um, I really had to slow down and, and really think about, you know, it, it's better for this to go slowly. And, um, and now even just reading it, I'm thinking about my walk and, you know, it isn't until we're done with the walk that we really know. And sometimes we don't know right away. So what made you pick this one? And um, do you want to add to to what why it speaks to you and what maybe you hope other pilgrims maybe take from it? Because I could be totally off base, but that's how I how I was interpreting it for my walk. Um, on that specific day at the um, one of the things that um, within this poem, um, who actually is a very um, uh, admired and recognized um, researcher and writer and uh, translator of ancient Greek is C.P. Kathabe. Um, he is probably, um, this translation um, is from a, a guy from the U.S. and who's probably around 90, he's very old, he's around 90 years old, but he's famous for his translations of uh, Greek, of ancient Greek mm -hmm. um, poems and hymns. And I chose that the whole plan for the book was to monitor um, the ups and downs of the Camino Frances. Um, the days that you had to climb, I chose a specific um, poem for that specific day, the, the days that you needed rest. Um, the days that you were weary, the days that you didn't think you could make it anymore. This is why I included that poem. And at that bottom of this, on this page, it, it, um, it references saying that the ship cannot comprehend the meaning of destiny until it has left the shore. Yeah. Um, the fear is, is prevalent in all of us. Sometimes um, it comes to the point where um, it prevents us from doing a lot of things in life. Um, a philosopher by the name of Zeno um, in ancient fifth, uh, fifth century BC, um, he talks about the body's motion um, and that typically um, a body must reach the midpoint um, while in motion before it can reach the end. And mm -hmm. When you think about this and you think about it, the Camino, how, now how does this apply to the Camino? It's like when you're first starting out, and I remember starting out in St. Jean Pied de Port, it was very overwhelming. 800 and some kilometers. Am I really going to walk 800 and some kilometers? People can become overwhelmed, and this is why they want to plan so much. Perhaps you need to just reach the midpoint. And if you can't reach the midpoint, then you think in your mind that you want to reach the quarter of the midpoint. Then if not, then do the eighth of the midpoint. When you get mm -hmm. to the eighth of the midpoint, then you plan for the next quarter. Then when you get to the quarter, then you plan for the half. And so this, this specifically poem by Kafave was meant to take your time. Take your time. You're not rushing. You don't need to rush. Um, I understand that some people have deadlines that they have to be at a certain point, but um, also to the pilgrims who are doubting whether or not they can do it is that you have to have, you have to board the ship for it to leave the shore. 
Wow. Okay. So much to, to talk about here. You know, I'm thinking that first day out of St. John, you know, and you start up the Pyrenees, you know, <laughs> when you had those doubts in that first day or first two days, if you divide it, um, they're quite challenging. And um, I love what you're saying about just dividing it up. You know, if you can't get to the midpoint, then divide that in half. If you can't get to that, that's a, that's a really great way of looking at it. So with your own walk, um, you said you ended up having to divide it up because there was no way of getting to Santiago uh, within that time frame. No, I think you would have to run <laughs> and run a lot each day to make that time. So you you stopped part way with your own Camino. Uh, where did you where did you stop? And then tell us about uh, how, how that felt. And then what made you come back and continue the walk? I stopped at San Juan door at Ortega. The reason why I stopped is because I had, I had a torn Achilles tendon, um, had severe problems with blisters like everybody does, but I, it prevented me from going on. Like I, I realized when I was in San, when it was in Belorado that I had to stay an extra day because I couldn't walk. I, I couldn't walk. I just could not walk. Um, I couldn't stand up on my feet because I had a torn a tendon. And part of it was because of shoes. I didn't understand about the shoe period at that time. Um, and the beautiful thing about it is I didn't want to stop because I had met people, you know, I had met friends until still to this day, I am remain friends to that to them, um, with them. And um, I didn't want to separate them. I didn't want to separate. I wanted to finish with them. But unfortunately, I couldn't, and yeah. and I had to also get get ready to go back to the university, which I was not looking forward to. But I um, did any I I had to. So that was the that's where I stopped. Um, when I um, picked up again in 2018, I picked up from San Juan de Ortego, um, and then walked the whole way to. Uh, uh, Santiago. Um, so San Juan de Ortega was one, one town before Burgos. And the good thing about coming back was even though I was not with those friends that I had met initially, I was able to meet new people. And that was the blessing of it all. You know, it's so hard to say goodbye to Pilgrim family members, isn't it? Whether they're pushing ahead or you're staying behind or vice versa, it's really hard to let them go. Um, we form such close relationships when we're walking with them. But the thing I want to encourage everyone to remember is just like Jean's saying is there will be more people and you will meet new Pilgrim family members. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> Usually that very, that very day or the next day when you're worrying, somebody else will pop up. So, um, were you carrying, I mean, you seem like you're very inspired by devotionals and, and different things. Was this something that you used? So when you go back in 2018, had you prepared some quotes or, you know, what, what did you do to motivate yourself when things were hard? Did you have special things that you read? Um, no, I had not prepared quotes. I took um, back in 2018. And again, still in 2018, I had not planned on writing a devotional book. So right. that was not wow. in that was yeah. not in, in my mind at the time. Um, my uh, tool that I used to motivate me was, was um, prayer and the churches. I have always been fascinated with um, churches and ancient churches and medieval churches and anywhere I travel throughout the world, I always seem to gravitate towards them. Um, and I get a lot out of the architecture. I get a lot out of the, the history of mm -hmm. the churches. Um, and so a lot of times also while walking, I would, I would never really, I'm not a morning person. So that was one thing about going on the Camino. So you have to be a morning person. I had to adapt. Of course, you have to adapt. But I'm not the one that should get up at 6 a.m. and walk in the dark. There's, <laughs> I can't really? do I think no maybe dark one walking. time, one or two times. And I think even that's, that's a lot. Maybe one time out of both times where I was walking in the dark. 
Um, I normally would walk, I would sometimes I'd be the last person to leave in the hamburger around 8 or 8.30, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was kind of good because everybody else had left and so I could take my time and I wouldn't have to be worried about it, you know? Um, a lot of times I would wait if some um, place, historical place in one of these ancient towns were not open till 10, sometimes I would hang around and I would go into them. You know, and oh. and most of the time, also those would be very quiet times. There wasn't anybody there, so I always had very. Uh, it's always where I got my strength. I got my strength from here. I got my strength from um, the prayer and being in the presence of the Camino and being in the presence of. Um, the history of it. Wow. Yeah, I, I feel I, there's nothing like being in these old churches, especially the tiny ones, and the unexpected beauty when the door opens sometimes just um, still blows my mind. I mean, I've been here six now over six years. I have never, ever, I'm still amazed. Uh, Lee, I mean, I now live in Sevilla. I mean, and uh, some of these churches I've been in several times, I'm still in awe of them. And it's what I feel, I feel a heavy heart sometimes of my native country, of our native country, the US, and the longer you stay in Europe, it kind of this culture seeps into you in ways that you had never have ex expected, but it's also a bless blessing in a way is, I feel so many people are missing out of their faith, the faith of Christianity also because of not these experiences, of the experiences not only of not walking in the Camino to where when you're walking in the Camino at that very first time in 2016, I also, you know, in the US back at that time, we had so many problems with, um, um, politically that mm -hmm. In 2016, when I walked, I felt a restoration of humanity. I felt this is goodness. This is kind. This is where truth is. Truth is along the Camino. We're looking for answers. Sometimes we don't get them when we want them. Sometimes we are looking them to be validated. But um, sometimes we just have to inquire. And you can inquire in medieval churches. You can inquire in churches where valor and virtue is, where um, you're in awe of them and you get inspired by them. And so a lot of the Camino is like that. Um, when I was traveling, the unique thing is when I was traveling in Japan a couple of years ago, before I had done the second part of the second leg, um, mm -hmm. since I also collect books, I'm an avid book collector, I walked into a Japanese bookstore, and that's just one of always the times that I, when I go travel places, I like to go to bookstores, to see what I, you know, see what they have in English and what foreign books they have, and I went into a bookstore in Kyoto. Kyoto in Japan yeah. and I was just walking by and I saw this book and it had um, Romanesque churches of Europe and I picked it up and it was from this widely at the time I didn't know but this widely acclaimed Japanese photographer who had traveled to um, Spain, France, and Italy, and went to go and document all of the Romanesque churches. So Romanesque would have been um, around the ninth and tenth century. And how the book is how the book is laid out is that uh, in Spain, a lot of them are along the Camino. And so when I saw this, of course I picked it up. It was a big. I mean, it's a big, thick book. Some of these churches and the pictures he took, I actually planned to stop to make sure I actually saw them when I walked the second time. That is so and cool. I, one of the most favorite places for Romanesque architecture is in Fromista. Mm -hmm. Fromista. Um, 
and I don't know if you went to the church in Formista, but it's a Romanesque church. And I remember one day I had taken my camera out and the corbels, the corbels are these, these um, ancient um, kind of gargoyle. They, lot, they have a lot of gargoyle faces. Um, and I took pictures of every single corbel around the Formista church. And it was so, it was interesting that day because somebody was sitting on a bench on this plaza of Fromista, this girl, and she was like, she watched me. She, I, I didn't know her, but she was watching me as I was taking the pictures. And she came yeah. up to me. She said, "It's so fascinating for you to see, of to take pictures of these." And I'm like, "Do you know? Do you not understand how important <laughs> and historical this church is for Romanesque architecture?" And uh, Katie is her name, and. Katie and I are now have, have become really close friends. She actually lives in Oregon. Really? Um, yeah, she lives in Oregon. She was a pilgrim from Oregon. Um, but it's just, this is my um, inspiration that I get um, by these type of architectural elements in uh, medieval ages that in modern times, we would look at them in kind of a, maybe of a harsh critic or, you know, would be, Maybe some people are offended by them. I don't know, which is to me kind of strange because how could you be offended by um, these type of elements now as opposed to in modern times we get offended by just statements that make people stay that irrelevant, you know? Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Now, did you do a pilgrimage in Japan as well? No, no, no. I thought about the Henro. Um, which is why I included it at the very bottom, at the very end of my book, is because I tried to list other places that throughout ancient times have had pilgrimage routes. As we know, the Camino de Santiago is one of the three modern pilgrimage routes in that has survived, being after Rome, Jerusalem. Um, there's been so many pilgrimage routes throughout you know, the early Christianity that are no longer available to us. One is because they may be in territories that are difficult to get to, or they um, no longer exist. And it's my hope that one day that I am able to take a, a new pilgrimage at one of these uh, places. For instance, it's been my desire to go to Mount Athos. Mm, um, Mount Athos. Mount Athos is um, a small little peninsula that juts out at the um, top of Greece. It mm. is um, the only remaining place in the world where they still adhere to the Byzantine texts of over a thousand years ago, where it's all monasteries. Unfortunately, women are not allowed. It's only men, and you have to be invited to get into it. Um, wow. And I would dream, I love, I've had a dream to get to Mount Athos and I hope to be there one day. Um, that is one pilgrimage that I hope to take and another pilgrimage that I would love to even, because sometimes after the Camino de Santiago, um, people are looking for new routes. Um, they want to be inspired. They're looking for, for other um, divine um, meanings to their life. It's, excuse me, um, Mount Sinai and St. Catherine's uh, Monastery. Um, those are the two places that I hope to walk to. Um, walking, maybe not in the sense of Camino de Santiago, because it's very unique as we have learned. Right. But as another, pilgr as another pilgrimage uh, location, um, Yeah, I wanted to, um, well, two things you, you reminded me of. I'm also not a morning pilgrim, so I totally get you on that. <laughs> um, the second day after my dog Cooper was here at the house, um, at about 4.30 in the morning, we he, he wakes me up um, barking. There was actually a pilgrim walking by at 4.30 a.m. Oh, wow. So I don't know. I mean, they were walking so early that it would have been too early to even, you know, they would be to Cruz de Ferro before 
way before sunrise. So I'm not sure. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> I don't know how this person is doing it. So there are early morning pilgrims and it can be done, folks. You just have to have some lights <laughs> if you're going to do that. But um, yeah, I love the story of uh, you finding this book and then uh, the cathedrals and the churches along the way. I wanted to talk about somebody, uh, had, a friend of mine had mentioned, we all have this fascination with people, uh, Nancy Reynolds, who's the Camino coach. Um, we have this fascination with people who walk multiple Caminos. And when I was last night, I was just kind of doing a little bit of research before our interview. And I found um, this quote from you that said, sometimes people ask me, why do so many people return for another Camino and another and then another? My answer is because our soul has finally found that path, which leads us to the knowledge of wisdom and truth. We are at home there and our soul knows it. Instead of our physical presence leading the soul, the soul leads us. That is why people return to the Camino. I think that's worthy of being a, a day, a quote of the day in your book. You should have added an extra day, Jean. Thank you. It's so insightful. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, maybe kind of build upon what you're talking about there? You know, as I mentioned earlier about restoring your faith in humanity in the Camino, um, in the beginning of the book, I mentioned a Doric, about the Doric proverb, but I never really mentioned what that Doric proverb was that a lot of ancient philosophers and uh, authors speak about. The Doric prophet, prophet in a proverbial sense means have everything be smooth to the line or smooth everything in your life to a line. Um, and that means what is true moves forward. And that which is virtue settles to its rightful place and it removes all others. So if you want to take an example of harvest of wheat, so basically harvest, harvest of wheat is when the wheat is being harvested, what is, what is it that remains from the, from the, uh, um, from the, the, from the wheat? It's the kernel. After you settle everything off in the sieve and after it's shaken, the shaft is always falls through and it goes to the ground and the most important part is left and it's the kernel. And it's the kernel of our soul that we, that we have within us as we're walking the Camino. The most important thing is the kernel. And what is in the kernel? It's, in, it's this part of the truth that we don't realize that we have because we overlook it because we live in a modern capitalist society. We have forgotten basic principles. We have forgotten basic truths. Um, we're consumed with greed. We're consumed with power. We're consumed with overconsumption. We don't respect the nature. We don't respect nature. Um, and the Camino strips that all away. And it strips it in a way that in this door of proverb is that everything that's important to us, it's there, it's there on the line, it's there all straight and what everything else falls away. All of our materialistic items and cares fall away. All of our pain falls away. And as we're walking little by little, day by day, through pain and through toil, you know, it's also extremely important in one's life. Even in today in modern society, we don't want to be toil. We want everything instant. And I just recently wrote something on LinkedIn where, um, and it's, to me, it's kind of, it's, it's sad that uh, a CEO of an investment banker was so proud that their kid of a nine-year-old wrote a story of how to be an economist. And I um, got to the point now living in Europe for six years and in my experience, and I'm like, you know, we have enough businessmen. We have enough business women. We need more artists. We need more painters. We need more dancers. We need more writers. We need more poets. We need more archaeologists. We need... We need more pilgrims. Could you imagine 
how, how many times have you personally thought how many of your uh, 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 either close friends or acquaintances or people you have met, how many lives could be transformed if they just took this first step on the Camino? And once you get there, the soul knows that it's good. The soul knows that it's virtues because you know what? Sometimes the impossible, that sometimes when we didn't think we could do it, we've done it. That's what that Compostela is granted to us is because it's a reward because we never thought we could do it, but we did it. And sometimes people have done it through great pain. And it is because of the soul gives you the strength to do it. And the soul is it's matched with the divine. And when you constantly are walking through villages who were erected in the medieval ages for the sole purpose of tendering to pilgrims as they walked, and what a thousand, fifteen hundred years later, a thousand, twelve hundred years, it's still they're still their generational families from one to the next have still been in service to pilgrims. And it's a place that we can um, strip everything away that we have had as an adored proverb and why people want to keep continually returning is because, you know, the most, because they feel at peace there. And I think the most, the most, uh, uh, Touching thing is always when you're walking along the Camino and you see these small little stellies. Well, what in ancient times they would be stellies, basically monuments of people um, who have walked or people who have died and they have been erected. Um, it always is touching. It's always touching when you see these. A few days ago, I was in a um, another Zoom meeting with an Anglican. Anglican, the Anglican Pilgrim Center of Santiago, which is trying to erect a um, pilgrim center for English speakers um, in Santiago. And one of the things that touched me most was this Anglican priest who had walked in 2005, for him to say that the most important part of his life and the thing that moved him the most was the Camino de Santiago. And when a priest says this, you know that it has weight, it has value. I just, in a daily pilgrim devotional, not only did I want to reach pilgrims walking, but to people like me who had never heard of it, that who like devotionals who now may read daily pilgrim devotional who now will hopefully inquire to see what this is about. I'll tell you, I think I, I should end the interview right now because that was an answer that was so beautifully stated. And Jean, that you really summed up so many feelings I have about uh, the Camino uh, much more eloquently than what I could say it. Um, so I really appreciate those words and wow. Yes, I think that's, you know, I think that's the reason that I do this podcast is uh, there are many times that I think about our world would be at peace if everybody was just walking the Camino, you know, because I think we get to see everybody at their best and we get to remember that, you know, we're all one, we're all the same when we're out there walking, I think it would be, it would be a much more peaceful world. So I kind of want to get on the rooftop and shout, come walk, but I know, um, it's best shared through these stories, which is um, what I hope. I hope these stories inspire people to walk. I know that they. I know that they are. Um, and then also, your book is a way to inspire someone. I think that's beautiful. That somebody might pick up a devotional just because they like devotionals, and then now they're introduced to the Camino. That's such a cool, cool idea. Thank you. Wow. All right. Well, let's read another passage. Um, So I wanted to do, let's do, 
day 10, which is another roomy. <laughs> the soul comes every day at dawn. Good to see you again, my friend. The peace of God be with you. And I love what you wrote after that. Uh, it's great to be alive. The sound of the cock knows lights early break. We feel youth. We begin anew like a caterpillar transforming into God's handiwork. In the depths of darkness, the still soul breaks for freedom. In a world of despair, look for the one who will guide you on. So day 10, that was still probably a pretty hard day if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, so what, why this particular Rumi? Because we talked about how much you liked Rumi. Um, and here's another Rumi, another Rumi one, uh, a different one. Yeah. So what inspired yeah. you to have this one? Um, that one specifically was at a point when you're walking the Camino de Francis and about day 10, it's like your body has adapted to the Camino, but you still feel achy, you still are tired, but you still keep going on. And it's just good to take in the nature at that period is, you know, the mornings when you're able to see the sunrise as you're walking, it is quite beautiful. And I wanted to just also have people come to the realization that we don't need TV, we don't need social media, we don't need even music at the time of walking the Camino because nature provides it all. Nature provides the music with the birds. Nature provides the smells with the flowers. Nature provides the sights with the sun as it hits our face um, in the morning when it's still kind of crisp, but yet that sun kind of like feels warmth, you know, when it first touches us. Um, and so that's what I wanted to get across on that, on that specific passage. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. It's a great reminder that we have this new day starting. I think one of the one of my favorite things about walking the Frances is you know, you rise and the sun, you know, is behind you, and you turn around and you see this beautiful sunrise, and the heat is hitting the back of your body as you're walking, and then seeing the moon rise, I guess I would call it, you know, so the moon being ahead. Uh, there's some mornings uh, I wake up and the sun's behind, the moon's still showing ahead, and it's just a, a beautiful natural, natural feeling uh, to be connected back to nature. And, and yes, the sounds of the birds are so lovely. And there's our puppy. He's uh, I'm probably making <laughs> my maximum time. Of him. <laughs> I tried to sneak some some treats behind guys, but I think he's now waking up. He's like, hey, what's going on? They've been talking for a while. <laughs> So sorry about the little little growls if you're hearing that. He's trying his best to be quiet, but <laughs> I don't know how much longer we'll get. Well, Gene, congratulations on your book. I found it so useful during my own pilgrimage, and it's it was just a delight to find out about it just in time before I took off. And I am so glad we got to have this conversation to hear about your own pilgrimage as well as your book. And um, yeah, I, I really look at it now as a, as a letter to pilgrims, a gift to us. Uh, and there he is. He is now really acting out. So excuse the puppiness, but um, thank you for coming. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we close? Um, the only thing I would say is just the pilgrim's prayer card that I mm -hmm. had just included just a little quote in um, day 17 that I just would like to read before we close, if it's okay with you. Yeah, please do. Um, on day 17, at the end of it, um, on the phrase, um, I said, this is, <clears throat> the pilgrimage cleanses us with newness of purpose. As a pilgrim prayer states, if from today I don't continue walking your path, searching and living according to what I have learned, and from today I do not see in every person, friend or foe, a companion on the Camino, if from today I cannot recognize God, the Father, the Father of Jesus of Nazareth, as the one God of my life, I have arrived nowhere. That's a perfect way to end. I love that.
Las cosas que necesito en la vida ya están aquí. Las cosas que necesito en la vida ya están aquí. I am free, free as a bird now, with my feathered wings. I am free, free as a bird now, with my feathered wings.